So the next, very next example is something about laminar flow. of blood in a, an artery or a vessel. So, a vein might be a better alternative term here. Uh, you know, blood comes from the heart and out the arteries, and blood comes back in through Veins, I believe. That's, is that the correct terminology? Biologists? Pre-meds? Yes? No? Okay. Mm. Arteries. Oxygen-rich blood for sure. Okay? All right. Um, laminar. What does laminar mean? Laminar is the, in a sense, opposite of turbulent. Okay? Laminar flow means that we've got inside something or just out in, in, the, in the atmosphere We've got nice, smooth flow of stuff through here. So if, if you've got a fluid moving through this tube, you could imagine that there's lamina, which are layers, literally layers, of little cylinders. Inside, so you can imagine, imagine little cylinders sort of stacked or nested together. These are called the laminae, the lamina. And they slide nicely. As opposed to turbulently. So if inside this tube you imagine there's a fluid and the fluid has a bunch of layers and they slide through each other. The ones against the wall you could think of as roughly stationary, moving slowly. The next one in is moving a little faster, and it slides nicely on the previous one. The next one inside moves a little faster, and it slides nicely on the one on, right? Um, you can also think of uh, what this might look like as it comes out. So imagine just a hose. Laminar flow is what you see right as the water exits a hose. It's a nice cylinder of water, right? as opposed to right before the water hits the ground. You know, it arcs up in this nice tight cylinder and eventually it starts to spread out. And by the time it hits the ground, it's, it's turbulent to some extent. So laminar flow is the nice smooth flow of a fluid. That's what happens inside a, a small radius artery with a sufficiently viscous fluid like blood. We wouldn't work very well if we had turbulent flow inside our veins. Laminar flow is what you want. Um, if you're familiar with uh, how the heart works, um, there's a lot of mixing of blood inside the heart, right? Um, as it's pushed from chamber to chamber. Uh, what you want, though, is that overall flow to be in one direction. What you don't want is the turbulence to be sufficient that the valve doesn't work correctly, the blood goes backwards. Right? That's a heart valve malfunction. And that's why people have valves replaced. Okay? So if valves get hardened over time, which they do as we grow older, um, or if they're just faulty for some reason, um, you get this turbulent flow that goes back and forth between chambers, atrioventricle, atrioventricle. <laughs> Deadly. Bad. Um, you want mostly laminar flow all throughout the whole body. Is that enough of a description of blood flow and lamina to get you thinking about the situation here? People are like, stop, please. Okay. Uh, I thought about making it a little bit more grotesque since it's almost Halloween, but I'm not going to go there. Okay, so laminar flow of blood in an artery or vessel can be described using this equation, which I'm not, I can't even read this guy's name. So French physicist, does anyone speak French fluently in here? Is that a yes? Can you read a name for me? Yes. Here's how I would say it, just for a nice pick and giggle. Jean Leonard Mar Marie Quiselli. 
Okay, now here's how it's actually said. It's right here. You and that? Fuck yeah, that's not all I would say. Jin, you and that? Mary, Osui. Wow. See, that's how it's supposed to sound, and I was nowhere close. Thank you. That's supposed to be embarrassing to me. It is. I'm going to turn it up here in a second. That name, the French physicist who discovered this, this law, it states that the velocity of blood through a laminar flow of blood in an artery or vessel can be described as V equals so velocity is P divided by 4 eta L times r squared minus little r squared. And here are what these things all mean. Okay, so I'm going to erase some of these guys. Describe these variables inside this artery up here. So if we have the central axis through our artery, capital R is this distance out to the outside there. Okay. Little r is the radius to that inner wall. So there's a relationship between the outer wall and inner wall of the artery. The thickness of that artery determines something about the laminar flow and velocity. Additionally, this P is the pressure difference between the ends of the tube. So if I measure the pressure here, on the left, and I measure the pressure here on the right, okay, that is P, the pressure difference. Okay? Alrighty. I might ask you, why would the pressure be different at the end of the tube than it is at the beginning of the tube? But then I would expect, I would expect that we're physicists of some sorts. But no? No one? If there's a valve not working, it could pack it up. Oh, yeah, okay. Mm. Yeah, perhaps there's some something in, in between here that gets moved. Or collapsed or something. Or collapsed yeah. or expanded. And now the pressure is no longer the same because pressure has been applied, which means force has been applied, which means work has been done, which means we no longer have sufficient energy at the end to maintain the same pressure. Bingo! She's got it. All right. You can become a doctor or a nurse. Perfect. Next, what is eta? What is this guy right here? This is the viscosity of the fluid. Viscosity is like a measurement of how thick the fluid is. Literally defined as resistance to change in shape. Water is viscous. It has some resistance to changing in shape. If you jump into a pool from a sufficient height, you really feel that resistance, especially if you belly flop. Whereas if you jumped into, say, a mixture of cornstarch and water, you would feel that when you stepped on it, not jumping into it. That's a really good example of a, quote, non-Newtonian fluid. It's something that cornstarch and flour, uh, water, it appears to get harder the more you try to move it. So if you scrape it with your fingernails, it will literally crack and peel away in flakes, which is not what water does. But it's still liquid. If you put it in your hand, it puddles. When you try and move it, it turns into a ball. And then it turns into a puddle. OK, so viscosity is a measurement of how much it resists that change in motion. Corn, starch, and flour, or water, extremely viscous. Water, still pretty viscous. Uh, gasoline, 
less viscous. Okay, you take other alcohols, less viscous. Okay. Anyway, L, maybe you can guess what L is. Length, yep, length of the pipe. Length of the tube. So it's not a very easy law to get around, right? There's a lot of, a lot of variables. So how do people usually study things like this in science? Do you, do you, well, usually we try and limit things as much as possible in order to study certain things. So for example, if we're only working with one fluid in that tube, we can keep the viscosity constant. If we restrict ourselves to only working with one fluid, so that becomes a constant. If we're working with a tube of a specific length, we, we've fixed that. If we work with a specific rigid tube that doesn't deform, then we can maintain this pressure difference as constant as well. And then we can also decide these guys, perhaps. But we need to let something change, one thing change, in order to determine this law in the beginning. And that's how a person, I can't say his name, discovered this, you know, beginning. scientifically isolated variables. So here we go. There's this question of how does the velocity change? Is there a way we can compute changes in velocity uh, with these variables perhaps in changing, how does that change affect the change in velocity? Right, if we have some tube of some fixed length using some fluid and applying some force to the fluid to go through it, if we allow the radius of the tubes to change, how does that affect the way the velocity changes, for example? Or if we change the length of the tube, we keep everything else fixed, how does that affect the velocity of the tube through it? The velocity of the fluid through the tube, right? So we can say that the velocity depends on how the variables So in your book, what they say is, let's just focus in on um, keeping eta, p, and L constant, as well as capital R. And we'll look at how this changes, velocity changes, with little r changing. So the situation now is we're going to look at how the fluid velocity changes as we constrict this little r. We maintain pressure, we maintain length, viscosity, outer radius, we just make this tube thinner and thinner. What does your intuition say about velocity? Have you ever used a garden hose? How do you make the water go further? You got the garden hose, water's coming out, you want the water not to fall there, but to fall way out there, you with your thumb, right? You decrease the radius by capping the end. Okay, so if we think about this, how does the velocity change when the radius, this one, inner radius changes? I think we have some intuition as to what we should expect. Velocity should go higher if we make this thing smaller. Velocity should go down if we make this thing bigger. Right? Yes. We've all experienced that since like a wee little age of like four or five in the backyard or wherever it was. Or perhaps when drinking your coffee. Do you drink your coffee out of like a normal straw sometimes? Or is, no? No? Okay, next time you're at like a Starbucks or something, get one of those Actually, maybe now you can. Oh, well, they used to. Oh man, did they make paper straws of different diameters? 
Hmm. It used to be that you could get like the normal straw, and that you could get the quote stir sticks, which were really just tiny itty bitty straws. And if you were ever like me, then you got both sometimes and just had fun drinking out of this one and this one and seeing that. the difference. <laughs> you laugh, but I, it's for, for real. Try it. Or maybe you laugh because you've done it as well. Yeah, when you drink out of here, I mean, you get a mouthful of coffee. That's great. Not so much here, but the coffee hits the back of your throat when you use this. <laughs> Which, depending on how hot it is, it's not a good thing. Anyway, um, right, so let's figure this out. So we're going to have this be constant, this is constant, this is constant, and this is constant. We're going to differentiate this with respect to little r. Okay, so this is the variable we're differentiating with respect to. Everything else is going to be constant. So what is this? P over 4 theta L capital R squared minus little r squared. So the left side just says, hey, the dv dr, this is called the velocity gradient or the instantaneous change in velocity. Okay. Uh, gradient, this is just another word English isn't your first language, actually. This might be the word that you use in your translations of another slope, another word, which I just almost said, uh, from algebra class, slope. Uh, when I worked in Asia, students knew exactly what this meant, but they didn't know what S-L-O-P-E meant, because the translation from the Chinese word for slope to English was that. So depending on where you're from, that might be what you're familiar with. Gradient means something like slope. Okay, and on the right side, we've got a constant. Well, that can come out of the derivative. Constants, which can come out of the derivative. Like that. Now we've got a derivative of a difference. To take derivatives of differences, we just take the derivatives of each piece, right? The derivative of r squared is zero, because that's constant. And what's the derivative of? little r squared with respect to r. This is the exact variable there, so do we need implicit differentiation here? No, we don't. So when you, when you know for sure that this is this, implicit differentiation is not needed. Implicit is needed if this does not match that, and this depends on that. That r squared is a function of r, but it's literally the same variable. If this was x and this was y, and y was a function of this x, then we would need to implicitly differentiate. So here we can just do this. So 0 minus 2r. So there we have it. How does the velocity change? So if we have some radius. Oh, um, yeah, right. Sorry, just putting it all in one line. If we have some radius, little r. Yeah, 
confirm that I got it. We're not talking about rates with respect to time, which threw me for just a minute here, but we're good. So if we've got some radius little r, and we want to know how quickly the velocity changes at a specific radius, this is how we can determine it. And this simplifies just a little bit. The two can cancel with the four, so we've got negative p r over four turning into two theta l. So now you can imagine little r decreasing down and increasing up to the outer radius. And this can give you a picture of how quickly the velocity would change at that specific radius while moving r. Okay. So we, you know, if you wanted to, you could play around with this idea, like I said before, and see how the velocity is changing. One thing to note, though, is the negative sign. The radius r is positive, right? Pressure is positive. Eta, viscosity, is positive. Length is positive. What this is saying is the velocity is decreasing makes sense. If I pick little r to be zero, the velocity is not changing at all because nothing goes through. If I make it minuscule, then the velocity is changing very little. And as I make this bigger and bigger and bigger, the velocity is changing more and more and more in a negative way. Meaning the fastest velocity is with the smallest radius. And any increase in radius gives us a corresponding decrease in velocity. In the opposite direction, garden hose experience here. If you make a decrease in the radius by putting your thumb over the garden hose, you will achieve a faster velocity out, which means throwing the water further into your garden or at your sibling. Okay. That's about as worked out as I can give it in an example, except for actually plugging things in. But when we start plugging things in, we have to worry about units and making sure everything lines up and everything's actually reasonable. And that's just a lot of numbers and units that I don't want to cancel out and compute with the calculator. So we're going to stop here. And I'll let your biology teachers throw the scary numbers and units at you. Okay. As I erase, just kind of an aside. Do you study stuff like this in your biology classes here or in your classes? Anyone? No? Not really? Oh boy. Okay. So not a really good again for you. Or maybe good. So you see it somewhere. Do we want to see a chemistry example, or do we want to move on to 3.8? Chemistry. Chemistry. One of the four and a half people from last time. Like, chemistry. OK, here we go. Um, hmm. You have a choice. Do you prefer the number four or five? Which one's easier? No. <laughs> five is a nicer number. Five is a nicer number. It is prime. It's primer. OK. We'll go from there. Oh, great. Thermodynamics. I take it back. <laughs> <laughs> he takes it back. I'm wondering if I have the ability to understand this. Yes, I think maybe. So we will go forward. The thing is, like, you know, you, you study math, right, as a math person, and you study all these functions and equations, and you're like, great, I know how all these things work. But you don't know any of the words that chemists use to describe these things, or biologists use to describe these things. 
And so, you know, a chemist will come in and say, hey, do you know anything about isothermal compressibility? And I say, absolutely not. Isothermal compressibility. Uh, I know this means like the same temperature and being able to be compressed. So I'm guessing this means something like, can something be compressed and maintain temperature? That's what I would guess, right? But I would probably say to the chemist, no, I do not. But then a the chemist would write this down. 1 over the volume of the gas or the thing times the change in the volume divided by a change in a pressure. And I would say, well, this I can tell you about. That's just calculus. I know nothing about this. But this is called the isothermal compressibility. Apparently, this is one of the quantities of interest in thermodynamics. And here we go. If a given substance is kept at a constant temperature, isothermal, then its volume V depends on pressure. So we could talk about how the volume change and the pressure change relate to each other in this ratio. And this thing called isothermal compressibility, so something's ability to be compressed, change volume, at a given temperature is called beta, and that's given by 1 over V negated times the change in volume over a change in pressure. Apparently. Mathematically, what do we have here? Mathematically, we've got just a function of volume times the derivative of that volume. I might ask you, where does this come from? It looks like it's the derivative of a logarithm, right? Like if I gave natural log of negative v, then the derivative of this is beta, with respect to pressure, of course. You see that? D of this, with respect to pressure, natural log of this, well, we take 1 over this, there's the negative 1 over V, but volume depends on pressure, as we all know from one of the chemistry laws. Which one was that? Charles? Boyles? One of these laws. Times V prime dv over dp, implicitly, right? So there, I wonder what now chemists call this, the natural log of the negative of the volume of the gas. It probably has a name that I don't know. But if you take the rate of change of this guy with respect to pressure, you get this, which is called isothermal compressibility. Okay. So for example, uh, they give us this. They say, for instance, the volume in cubic meters of a sample of air at 25 degrees Celsius uh, is found from this equation. Volume equals 5.3 over the pressure of the air, where P is pressure in kilopascals. given this 
This comes from that law which I was describing, the relationship between volume and pressure. From this, we can actually find the rate of change of volume by differentiating, right? So let's go ahead and find that. So we need, in order to find the isothermal compressibility of air at 25 degrees Celsius, we need to be able to find a rate of change of the volume in terms of pressures. Here's our relationship, so we differentiate it. Here I see P to the negative first power. I'll just think of it that way. I also see a constant, which I can take out front. So here now, I apply the power rule, multiply by the negative one, subtract one from it. So this is negative 5.3 times P to the negative 1 minus 1, which is negative 2. Or negative 5.3 divided by P squared. Which tells us how quickly the volume of air at 25 degrees Celsius changes when pressure changes. And that is exactly negative 5.3 divided by the specific pressure squared. So if I give you a pressure, this tells you how fast the volume is changing at that pressure. So, here we go. D, V, D, P at P equals 50 kilopascals can be just computed by plugging in 50. Negative 5.3 over 2500, which I don't know, is some decimal number. Looks like 0 0.00212. Kilo or milo? So what is the isothermal compressibility of air at 25 degrees Celsius? If I know the volume, and I know the rate of change, well, there we have it. The volume is 5.3 over 50, so this is 50 over 5.3. like 50 kilopascals, this equation gives us the volume. So 1 over the volume is just 1 over the result of that formula. And then times the rate of change of the volume at that pressure. So the isothermal compressibility is some value. That's what you get. Yes, hands everywhere. Did I make a mistake? Probably, yes. No, what? Go, yes. Yeah, Wait, if it's related to math, I can answer it. If it's related to the chemistry, I'm sorry. Yeah, yes, math. go ahead. 50, why don't you move it over to where it says the V? Great, that's a math question. Here's our equation for volume. Uh -huh. Okay, so this comes down to one of the laws of gases, that volume is inversely proportional to pressure. The volume of gas. Right. I can't remember who came up with that law. It's Charles Boyles. It's not Avogadro's. It's one of the other ones. Does anyone remember from Chem? Google. Google would tell me. 
some famous long dead person discovered. Um, so we have this volume as this, right? So in the compressibility formula, we have one divided by volume, right? And we're concerned with the compressibility at this pressure. Well, at that pressure, the volume is 5.3 over 50. Yes. So here I have negative 1 over V. Negative 1 over V. 50 kilopascals, 5.3 over 50 is the volume of the gas. Other hands? No? That was it? So you don't need the temperature. That's the thing. <laughs> Isothermal, maintaining the temperature, okay. and still compressible. Yeah, just reading this, it seems like um, this is a measurement of how capable a fluid is of being compressed and maintaining a temperature. Okay. Have you seen the uh, the fun ex the fun plunger experiment in physics classes, chemistry classes, where um, I'm going to reuse this. <clears throat> you take a little piece of like cotton and you put it inside a glass tube. It's closed at the bottom, and then you put a plunger in. which is attached to just another thing here. You smack this end as hard as you can. Your hand, a stick, whatever. It compresses this gas very quickly. How well can air compress without heating up is my question. And the answer is not very well. Because what happens to this piece of cotton? It ignites when you do this. It burns. If you've never seen it, you should go try it. But I would suggest buying one of these tubes because the chances that you grab a piece of glass capable of withstanding the pressure without breaking are slim. So buy one that's nice glass so that you don't smash it with your hand and cut your hand into two pieces or more. But it's really fun. Also, if you've ever used a hair product or something, hairspray or shaving cream or whatever, you hold that thing down for a while, what happens? With a can. Cold. Yeah. Things in the opposite direction here. A gas, instead of being compressed and getting hotter, not maintaining temperature. Now the pressure and the volume are changing. Pressure is going down, volume is going way up, and the opposite situation happens with the temperature. It doesn't maintain it. The temperature gets colder. That's how all, that's this, this is what we're talking about. But those are situations where it's not isothermal. Yes? Uh, Google says it boils a lot. Boils a lot. Okay. All right. All right. I didn't have a function to give the exact name. I had a two possible set, and I, at least it was one of them. Okay. Boils a lot. Okay. Spelled B O Y L E, if I remember correctly. Maybe. That's what we're going with. <clears throat> it will not stand in the court of law. Questions about this one? Okay, yeah, definitely things you've experienced, right? Um, so that's fun. But maybe we don't know the words, like, like me, I don't know. I don't know if you know a lot about isothermal compressibility. For you chemists out there, do you learn about it in your classes? Not yet. Not yet. Sure. But you learned about boils law. Yeah, we know. But you didn't know the name either. That's okay. Oh man, we're terrible chemistry students. It's <laughs> But those names sound familiar, right? Yes. Yeah, well, perfect. So we're all equivalent when it comes to chemistry at this point. Oh. No, I'm sure you know much, much more. Okay. That's all I got on 3.8. Yes, 3.7, yes. So when we practice this on like weather side, are they going to like explain what the variables mean? Or are we yeah. supposed to? Okay. Yeah. Uh, if you haven't started the homework for 3.7, that's due next Thursday, I think. Yeah. Um, and it is up. Is that right? It's due next Thursday? I thought it was due this Thursday. Yeah, well, that's terrible. 
<laughs> I'm going to push that back. Push that back, by the way. 3.7 officially due next Thursday. Stop all working on it. If you've worked on it so much already, I'm really sorry. Like, seriously, very sorry. Yes, it gives you, in the introductory statements of each problem, it describes the variables at hand. Okay. So much like what I did. It doesn't draw the arrows to the formula. Uh, just in paragraph form, it gives you things. Yep. Other questions on 3.7? At this point, you know, I'll say, if you really liked seeing these problems work out, then I would say, yeah, consider a major in like biology or chemistry or physics, because this, this is what you do. It's like applying the mathematics, right? It's really fun. If you really liked rather the mathematics of it, you didn't care what the names were, I would encourage you to consider a math major. And if none of this really got you going at all, that's fine. Um, that's fine as well. There's as I say to most people when I tell them to major, I say, the world needs more of those majors, which is true. We need more people in other majors for sure. But just sort of give you some direction. If you like that chemistry, physics, biology majors, definitely up your alley, perhaps. OK, that's 3.7. I saw someone packing something. We still have 23 minutes. So we are now on to section 3.8, which is exponential growth and decay. So we've already seen examples of this, um, the population model from last time, and the population model from the beginning of this class. We've seen this. Um, we've also seen interest, computations. You invest some money, and you gain interest on that over time. Okay, if you maintain a constant percentage, Every compounding, that's an exponential thing. So we've seen that. Uh, you've probably also heard of something called nuclear decay, right? Uh, so if something has a half-life, a radioactive substance slowly decays into other things down the radioactive chain until it eventually arrives at lead, if it's above it usually, or something else if it's below it. So decay, radioactive decay. These are all very, very, very prevalent, very useful examples of things where something is either growing or it's getting smaller exponentially. And all of these things have in common one thing, is that the rate of change of that thing, so dy with respect to time, or some other variable, dx, whatever, is proportional. So there's some number. It's proportional to the thing itself. We think about population. And you remember the derivative we had. It was the initial population times the natural log of the base times the original amount. Right? 
if I rewrote this, this is just the natural log of b times this. The rate of change of the population is just some number times the population. I did the same thing with interest, continuous interest, for example. The amount of money at time t for some principal investment of at a rate r for some period of time t is given that, continuous compounding interest. The rate of change of this, I guarantee, is going to turn into something like some number of times the original, or the amount that we have, sorry. And it does. That constant is R. So let's just do it. The derivative of this is P times the derivative of this. Well, this is just E to the RT times the derivative of the exponent with respect to T here, which is just R. And that's just the original. Well, the amount a of t times some number. If you go on radioactive k, it would be something very similar. Take the derivative, and you would quickly see that there's just some number times the original function. Okay? If you have this situation where you've got a function, you differentiate it, and what you get is the function times a number. That means what you have is an exponential situation. What you're working with is exponential. This does not happen with anything other. Think of logarithms, right? You don't get a logarithm out when you differentiate a logarithm. You get one over something. When you take a polynomial and you differentiate, what do you get? Another polynomial, but is it a number of times the original polynomial? No, all the degrees are reduced. Right? And trig functions? Well, whole another question. So this section is all about functions like this. And uh, just some models of it. So I would describe this as the social science section. So we talked about natural sciences last time in 3.7, 3.8, kind of the social sciences, talking more about um, population growth or something, or you could talk about spreading of an idea, or you could talk about, oh, that's a fun one, Newton's law of cooling. Yeah. Back to physics. Sorry, I distracted by that one. Uh, continuously compounded interest, so banking, maybe social sciences or accounting, or sort of less, maybe perhaps less, I'm going to have to use this very loosely, less scientific applications. So oh, here we go. First, some language about this number. So if k is zero, nothing really happens, right? We have a constant function. The rate of change of the function is constant. So nothing happens if k is zero. If k is negative or if k is positive, we have special names for k itself. Um, in the case where k is negative, this formula is called the law of exponential k, which makes sense, where we have a change and the change is negative. So if we have some initial amount and we change it in a negative way, that means we're subtracting from the original amount, which means the thing is getting smaller. In the case where k is positive, we call it the 
the law of exponential growth. So just some terminology with that. And one other terminology and term that I want to get here. This is an example of differential equation. So there's this whole study of mathematics related to differential equations, actually. So this is what makes it a differential equation. Each of these little guys, dy and dt, we call differentials. You could think of them as sort of a naive, naive way. You could think of them as tiny changes in the variables, tiny differences. So this top differential is a tiny change in y. This differential dt is kind of a tiny change in t. And this gives you the idea of a tiny quotient of changes, which is the derivative. So this is a differential equation because it has differentials in it. Um, and if you want to study physics, uh, you're going to study tons of differential equations. Um, tons of them. In fact, I was a physics major a long time ago, and I stopped being a physics major because I was in a class where I needed to solve a bunch of differential equations, and I had no idea how to solve them. So I decided I'd take a class on differential equations to learn how to solve them, and here I am. Never went back. It was so fascinating. So, anyway, differential equations. So we already talked last time about population growth. First example. If we just change y to be a p, <coughs> so the difference of the population, the differential, with respect to time, is going to equal some constant k times the population. Right. I had that written on the board earlier, which tells us that k, the constant, can be solved by taking this differential and dividing it by p. Right. So I'm going to write the differential like this, just to say, to make it more obvious that this is some rate of change of our population divided by the population itself. And this is called the relative growth rate. When I've used words like doubling before, I was talking about this relative growth rate. Um, radioactive decay this is the next example. And then I'm going to, do I have time? Yes, I have time. Then I'm going to jump into that Newton's law of heating and cooling. Because it's just so fascinating. So radio, radio, what does that mean? Radioactive. What's changing in radioactive decay is actually mass. I'll say this about radioactive decay. Mass is breaking down into other masses. of a different sort. Uranium decays into... That's okay. Something else? Okay. When it's breaking down, it's no longer uranium. Okay. Protons are changing into other things. The identification of the substance is dependent on the number of protons in the nucleus, right? 
So when a proton becomes something else, you have a different element altogether. So what we're going to be talking about is the change in this mass, which is the change in what we've got. How much of it is left? How much of the plutonium? How much of the uranium? How much of the strontium? How much of the Einsteinium is left in our substance? As it decays, that amount of mass that's left is changing. So dm represents that difference in how much we have. We start with a certain amount of radioactive matter, it breaks down into something else, so now we have less, so now there's a difference between what we have and what we now have. That happens over time, and that's proportional to the original amount of mass we had. K is that obviously the rate over m. And K Oh, I thought they were going to give a name for it. Radioactive decay constant. Okay, decay constant is what's usually called. And this is really useful for discovering something called a half-life, actually. So, here we go. Um, we don't have time to do both examples, I don't think. So I'll see to you. Um, do you want to see an example of population growth, radioactive decay, or Newton's law of universal heating and cooling, or something else altogether? Newton's. Sorry? Newton's. Newton. She, you like big Newton's or no, cooling? No, we just seem excited. Newton. Okay, I Newton's, like yes! I was so excited about it. Hmm? For the radioactive decay equation, so um, earlier you wrote dy over dt right. equals kt. Yes. Kt. Kt. I should have wrote dy. Or ky. Ky. Okay. Ky. Yes. If I had a kt here, it should not have been t. It should have been this. Look at your notes. If I had a kt, it should have been k this letter. Check your notes. Yes. Then I think you wrote the same exact thing for exponential. I mean, it could be wrong when I wrote it wrong, but I think that's what you wrote. That's right. That's right. That's right. Oh. Notice. Um, oh no, this this one's wrong here. Yeah. That's that's where I wrote it wrong. Yeah, that should be y. So and this one's right, and this one's right. Okay, so but they're both the same thing. Then. It should be the same. Oh. Yes, but see now k is negative and k is positive. Oh. So according to this, when I wrote k being less than zero. When we have the law of natural law of exponential decay. I had kt. It should have been ky. So check your notes there. I apologize. Fix it. Okay. So I've got one vote for Newton's law of universal heating and cooling. Okay. This this is a fascinating one because I see right now that. Josh has a bottle of water and it's sweating, isn't it? Um, it's, uh, it's sweating. There's a little water on the outside, right? Yeah. What's happening to that water? It's called condensation. Right. Yeah. Because that's colder than the air outside, right? Yeah. And what's happening to the water inside? Um, it's, uh, it's warming up, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> Could you tell me when it's going to reach room temperature? Um, In how many minutes? Because um, I could. Uh, I'm not kidding. Well, I would guess maybe in like a, maybe in like an hour. Oh, yeah, I would guess. Well, it depends on the container, though. It does depend on the container. The thermal permissivity there, how much heat can pass through. And it depends on... Keep going. This is great. What do you think? Does it depend on how cold it initially was? Ooh. Depends on how cold the water is. How much water there is. Depends on how much water there is, how much heat is inside there. So now we're talking about specific heat of the actual substance. We're talking about the insulation properties of the container. We're talking about initial temperatures of the stuff. You guys are just like Newtons, all of you. That's so great. Basically, the rate at which it warms up, on, yeah, the rate at which it reaches room temperature is dependent on a bunch of different variables. Yeah, and you're like right there. 
like when, when Newton and Leibniz and other people were inventing calculus to talk about this sort of thing, prediction of how hot something will be at some point in time, they were isolating variables, they were thinking about the mathematical structure, and then they were using calculus to add up very small changes over time. That is what leads me to the example of Newton's Law of Universal Heating and Cooling. When I used to teach, I used to, you know, when I used to teach without a mask, I used to bring coffee in with me every day. Because I like to drink coffee a lot. Mathematicians turn coffee into theorems. It's kind of a requirement of the job. Um, so when I used to teach, though, in high schools, and I would get to this section of the year, I would always carry thermometers with me. And at the beginning of class, I would stick the thermometer in my coffee, write the temperature down, and then about 45 minutes later, I would take another temperature reading, and then I would tell the students how warm it was going to be at the end of class, and we'd see how close the prediction was. Yeah. And I did this with the same mug all the time, so I got really good characteristics of that mug and how insulated it was. And my predictions over time got closer and closer to being spot on. Yeah. So here's Newton's law of universal heating and cooling. You, you all nailed it, actually, when you were thinking about this. It says that the rate of change of the temperature over time is equal to some constant k, which kind of encapsulates the insulative properties of your container, times it needs to include t, because otherwise it wouldn't be exponential, right? Minus something else, ds, that you also came up with, temperature of the surroundings. And I'm not kidding, this is pretty accurate. If you take a few measurements of k, essentially, by looking at this equation, if you take measurements and sort of estimate k by looking at this dt over dt over the difference in temperatures, you can estimate k, and then you can make predictions with it. How long will your coffee stay hot enough to drink? Or you could ask yourself, how long do I need to let my coffee sit before it's at a temperature which I'm comfortable drinking it? Maybe you could use that to inform your business decisions, McDonald's. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> but lots of you know you could use this. Uh, think about uh, production of of metallic parts from melted iron, molten iron, molten aluminum, whatever it is. You need the temperature to be a certain thing. You know, in the process of creating the molten stuff, you're just trying to melt it as fast as possible. So how long do you need to let it sit in order to reach the desired temperature for the inevitable production of a part? I guarantee this goes into the engineering. Guarantee. So let's suppose... Um, Let's suppose I finish this example on time and don't get really excited about it and just babble about it. And if that was the case, I'd be able to end class right now on time and say, thanks for coming. It's been great to have you today. <laughs> Sorry, it's time, right? I like this sort of stuff, you know what I mean? This, 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 this is fun part of calculus, so. Uh, quiz on Friday. I wanted to discuss this briefly. It's not going to be on 3.7. Um, it's going to be on, I'm just going to say right now, 3.6. 3.6. That's derivatives of inverse trig functions and derivatives of logs. Okay? Have a great day. I'll see you Friday.